Does it matter what we believe? Well, Jesus said that false messiahs and false prophets will appear and performing great signs and wonders to deceive, even if possible, the elect. Matthew chapter 24, verse 24. Paul also warned us in the book of Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 6, about false gospels. He said, I marvel that you were turning away so quickly from him who called you to a different gospel. But he says, there is not another gospel, right? That there's some, though, who, who want to trouble you and pervert the gospel of Christ. He says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a different gospel than what we have already preached to you, let him be accursed. What we believe is extremely important. And over the centuries, the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has been perverted in a number of ways. Today, I want to share with you four ways that the gospel has been perverted so that you can keep your eyes out for them. And if you've been negatively affected by it, so that you can flee from it. Welcome back to the Down to Earth Christian. Before we, we dive into our topic today, I really want to give a special thank you to the patrons of our channel. Thank you very much. You are helping to keep this channel going, and Lord willing, with the future help of future patrons, we will be announcing a full-length, full-feature podcast for you to enjoy and be expanding this ministry to every major social media platform. So if you think you'd like to become part of this work and join us here, well, there is a link down in the description below, or you can scan the QR code that is on the screen here. Now let's jump into our topic, four ways that the gospel of Jesus Christ has been perverted throughout the centuries, some of which are still very active today. The first one is the gospel of faith plus the law of Moses. Now, this perverted gospel was actually a major problem within the pages of our New Testament. I mean, it had only been a few years since Jesus ascended back to heaven. The apostles were still alive and roaming the earth and preaching the gospel, and yet some had already begun to pervert the gospel. Some of these were Jewish Christians who demanded that the Gentile Christians be circumcised and keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. This is exactly what they were teaching. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you were circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And then if you jump down to verse 5 here, it says, But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. You know, today there are a lot of people, I mean a lot of people, who are saying that we must keep the law of Moses. They are very adamant about that. Thankfully, though, this perversion was clearly refuted in the Bible, and we do not need to be deceived by them. At the council in Jerusalem that Paul and Barnabas went down to in Acts chapter 15, verses 22 through 31, this is what they said. Then it pleased the apostles and the elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. They wrote this letter by them, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren, to the brethren who were of the Gentiles at Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some who went out of us have troubled you with words unsettling your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such command, it seems good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay no greater burden than these necessary things. 
that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, and from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. You see, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit not to lay any other burden on them, such as keeping the law of Moses. And so this is clear evidence that it's not the gospel plus the law of Moses, as so many teach today. This perverted gospel is also refuted in the book of Romans, the book of Galatians, the book of Colossians, and the book of Hebrews. It's important to notice that, that those who seek to be justified by law, that is, to say that they are right with God because they keep the law, yes, I believe in Jesus, yes, it's Jesus that saves me, but... I need to keep the law also. Those who would be justified by law, it says, that they have fallen from grace. Galatians chapter 5, verse 4. This really illustrates the danger of accepting a perverted gospel. You know, there's another gospel which developed just a little bit later in church history, and that's, that's the gospel of works without faith. In this perversion, they exalt the importance of of certain ordinances to the exclusion of faith. Thus, some believed that you could baptize other people without them needing to believe or without them having any faith, even without their consent, and make them a Christian and have them be saved. Such as infant baptism. You could take a baby who knows nothing who can't believe, who can't repent, sprinkle some water on their head, call that baptism, and now they're a Christian. There is another example that was referred to as infidel baptism, which means that basically the Catholic Church would would force people to become Christians, either through coercion or possibly the end of a sword. Either way, they would accept Christ and be baptized against their will with no belief and no repentance. And they would call them now a Christian. However, the Bible clearly teaches that this is not right. This is a perverted gospel. Faith is absolutely essential to being saved and to pleasing God. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You see, you must believe. Faith is absolutely necessary for our salvation. You can clearly see this as well in John chapter 8, verse 24, and Mark chapter 16, verse 16. But repentance of sins and faith is also a prerequisite to baptism. You remember they were baptizing babies and calling them Christians. They were baptizing people by force or coercion and calling them Christians. But that's not what the Bible teaches. You remember the account where Philip went down from Jerusalem down to Samaria. He taught the Samaritans and and a lot of them believed and were baptized. And then he was told to go meet the Ethiopian eunuch on the road. The Ethiopian eunuch was in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah Philip comes up to him and says, do you understand what you're reading? He says, well, how can I unless somebody teaches me? So Philip gets in the chariot and preaches Jesus to him. Listen to what the Ethiopian eunuch said as soon as he heard the good news. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all of your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Belief in Jesus Christ is an absolute prerequisite to baptism. You can't baptize a baby who can't believe and say, you're now a Christian. You can't force somebody to be baptized and say, now you're a Christian. Remember in Acts chapter 2, when Peter was preaching that first gospel sermon, he was explaining to the thousands and thousands of Jews that were assembled there 
who Jesus was. And after, after he'd finished, he came to his conclusion. He said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Babies cannot believe, babies cannot repent, and therefore babies are safe. They don't need to be saved. People who are forced to convert to Christianity, forced to be baptized to become a Christian, they don't believe, they haven't repented, and therefore their baptism is meaningless. They have not become a biblical Christian. They may have become a political Christian or Christian in name only, or they may have become a Christian to avoid negative consequences from their neighbors and government, but they haven't become a disciple of Christ. You know, sometimes a perversion like that, a gospel of works without faith, causes people to, to swing way, way over to the other side. And that's exactly what we see happened with this next perversion of the gospel. It's called the gospel of faith only. Now, this gospel states basically that you can be saved by only believing in Jesus. Another way that they would say it is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And while if those terms are understood biblically, that's a true statement. The problem is the people who teach this gospel do not understand what biblical grace is, what biblical faith is. And so they say that there is no obedience required, especially baptism. Just believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. Now, like I said, this is probably an overreaction to what was taking place in history from this works-centered gospel, the pendulum swings far over during the Protestant Reformation to where people are now saying, oh no, oh no, no, no works at all. Just believe in Jesus, faith only. Unfortunately, that is not what we see in the Bible. And many, many Protestant denominations follow this perverted gospel. We've got to remember that the sum of God's word is true, Psalm 119, 160. And we can't just cherry pick certain verses that we want, take them out of context to prove our point. For example, John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There you go, right? There it is. We are saved by faith only right? Well, what if we were just to keep reading and, and take in a little bit more of the context and read down to say mm, verse 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Now that sounds just like verse 16, but check out the rest of the verse. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. You see, here is a further understanding of what it means to believe or what it means to have faith. Faith without obedience. It means the wrath of God is still abiding on you. It means that you will not see life. Faith alone without obedience is worthless. The Bible clearly teaches that Christ requires obedience. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Paul, talking about judgment day, said, when the Lord Jesus is revealed with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
You see, come judgment day, there will be judgment pronounced on not only those who don't know God, that's scary enough, but on those who know God and yet do not obey his gospel. Peter, he expressed deep concern for those who did not obey the gospel. For the time has come for judgment to begin with the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? This is a rhetorical question. He's not asking his readers to respond to him. Oh, this is what will happen, Peter. No. He's saying, dude, if it happens to us first, it's going to be super terrible for them. Those people that don't obey the gospel, it's going to be terrible. Super concerned about the souls of those who do not obey the gospel. That's what Peter was. This perverted gospel that claims faith only saves you contradicts plain statements in the Bible. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. I don't know how you can get any clearer than that. It says you are not justified by faith only, and yet there are millions of people who believe and thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of of pastors who teach, you're saved by faith only. The Bible clearly says differently. The gospel of faith only is a perverted gospel that won't save anyone. And that brings us to what is probably the, the most prevalent perverted gospel in popular culture, and that is the gospel of good works only. You see, many have the idea that as long as you're basically a a good person, you're going to go to heaven. Especially if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, you're in pretty good shape. I mean, you're not an axe murderer. You're not a child molester. You're not a genocidal maniac. So, of course, you're going to be saved and go to heaven. You're a good person. Why? Because we all know that all good dogs go to heaven. Thankfully, this perversion is clearly refuted in Scripture. We only need to look at all of the examples of good moral people in the Bible who needed to be saved. For example, Cornelius. He was a good man. Cornelius was a moral man. He was a devout man. Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 6. And yet, he still needed to be saved. Acts chapter 11, verse 14. What about the three thousand people on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 that needed to be saved. They were devout Jews from every nation. They had assembled in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover and Pentecost, and, and they had taken time out of their lives. They had come at great expense to travel from all over the Roman Empire to be in Jerusalem, and yet they all still needed to be saved. The Ethiopian eunuch, another very good and devout man, he traveled all the way from Ethiopia up to Jerusalem to worship and then was traveling back home reading the book of Isaiah, and yet he still needed to be saved. Acts chapter 8, verse 27. How about Lydia of Thyatira? I mean, she was a seller of purple. She was a good Jewish woman. She would go down to the river to pray. And yet she still needed to be saved. Acts chapter 16, verse 14. How about Paul? He was an extremely good and devout man, zealous for his religion. And yet he still needed to be saved. The Bible is clear that we cannot be saved by good works. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior towards man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us 
through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. You see, good people don't go to heaven. It's forgiven sinners that go to heaven. And chances are that you or one of your loved ones believes one of these four perverted gospels. Unfortunately, none of them are the truth. So what is the true gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? And how can we be sure that we are on our way to heaven? Well, we have a three-part video series that walks you through the entire Bible and ends with an explanation of God's plan to save mankind. I know that you are going to love it, and I will see you over there in just a second.